to AWARE. We are dedicated to communicating information that inspires your positive growth and change. Are you interested in a peaceful planet? Are you interested in optimal health? Are you living with purpose? Are you enjoying your life? We realize each person can make a difference, and our mission is to empower your awareness. The choices that you make in every moment shape your life, and we encourage you to realize that you have your own answers and to always listen to your own truth. We invite you to stay aware. Hi, I'm Lisa Gar, host of the Aware Show Health and Mindset series, where I get to speak with incredible people about what our life looks like going forward. How do we embrace and adapt to change? And then how do we maintain a healthy mind and body in the meantime? That's why we have this show, is so we can learn all sorts of different solution-oriented techniques and make it easier for us to get through and navigate through these very unprecedented times. So thank you for being here. My guest today says that we need to fix our lives before they're broken. And the way to do this is to recognize the direct, incredible relationship between the mind, the body, and love. In 1986, pediatric and general surgeon, Dr. Bernie Siegel wrote Love Medicine and Miracles, an incredible book. And subsequently he wrote many other best-selling books to help facilitate personal lifestyle changes and personal empowerment of our wonderful lives. And that's basically how healing begins. He has been a global pioneer in improving the, the medical education and medical care system and humanizing it, which we're seeing happen before our eyes now. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bernice Siegel. Thank, Thank you for joining me. We're still not where I'd like us to be in terms of oh, yeah. how doctors are trained. Um, you know, back, as you oh. said, when the book was written and in the 90s, I'm on the cover of a whole host of magazines because I was controversial. Um, I never forget being called to go on Oprah Winfrey's show. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, she loves me. But what she loved was all the conflict she could create by inviting other doctors there she never told me about. So oh. I'd show up and there'd be five doctors sitting there to argue with me. And I never forget one day, I have to mention this, there, there's a doctor there, I won't mention his name, but he said, I have a photographic memory and this is what you said in your book and you know, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I never said that. And Oprah's holding the book and she yeah. turned to the page and said, it's not there. And this is something I learned that it's people's attitude, you know, they're seeing what they feel about you, not what you wrote. So, you know, two people watch the same movie. One says, that was lovely. And the other one says, what a mess. So boring. What's different are the people. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I learned, in a sense, not to create conflict, but to just talk about my experience. Because then they couldn't deny what I was talking about. Otherwise, you get into all kinds of arguments. I mean, let me just mention one more thing. It gets crazy. Because I'm often saying, if you want to know the truth, read fiction. Now you'd say, <laughs> what are you talking about? The fiction authors are creating characters, but the characters are portraying life as the authors have seen it and really mm. observed it. So you know, I recited a, a lot poem called Miss G by W.H. Auden. It says in the poem, after he examines a doctor, examines this lonely woman, and he comes home that night and he's sitting at dinner with his wife and he says, honey, cancer's a funny thing. Childless women get it and men when they retire. It's as if there had to be an outlet for their, fooled, for their foiled creative fire. And a doctor in the audience yelled at me, just because it rhymes doesn't make it true. Hey, <laughs> he's got to argue with me. He can't cite statistics because it's a poem. But why would a poet write something if he hadn't seen it in life? And Solzhenitsyn well, in his book, Cancer Ward, uses this term that you never hear from a doctor. 
um, one of the men says, oh, I found this book in the medical library because they're all in the hospital. It says here there are cases of self-induced healing, not recovery through treatment, but actual healing. See? And it was as though self-induced healing fluttered out of the great open book like a rainbow-colored butterfly. When I read that, mm. it's like, wow, he totally agrees with me. See? He didn't use the word spontaneous remission. Years ago, they had that big show about cancer, and they never talked about people who got well when they weren't expected to. You know, I mean, learn from the people who don't die when they're supposed to. I learned that myself because when I began to meet people I thought were dead at my lectures or sometimes going back to the office for other reasons, it's like, whoa, how come you didn't die? And they always had a story to tell you about how mm. they changed their life and transformed it. And the other, the self-induced rainbow colored butterfly is the perfect description because yes, life is a struggle. You got to bust out of the cocoon. Then you spread your wings. Mm. The rainbow That's is your you... life yes. order and harmony. Okay? Everything is in yes. place. And so yes. again, you could say, He's a fiction author writing a novel, but think of those symbols he uses and what they are telling you. Yeah. Well, Bernie, you have seen this this story we're playing out right now in movies, in TV shows. I, it, a world pandemic was fiction at one point, and now it is real. And you're in your 87 wonderful young years of life. There's not a lot you haven't seen until now. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts around these unprecedented times, a world pandemic, from your perspective as a surgeon and as a healer. First, I have to, because you mentioned my age, my mother-in-law was a wonderful lady, an opera singer. She lived into her 90s, and I would like at a birthday, I would say, sing for everybody. But this is something opera singers I've learned from watching movies about their lives. One of them said, being on the stage is hell. And I then understood my mother-in-law because everything had to be perfect. If you didn't sing the right note, you were a failure, a disaster. And so she didn't want to sing when she was 91 or 92. And I'd say, I'm so proud of you and your age. And she would say, my age is not a matter for discussion. <laughs> I never forget her for that. But um, yeah, through humor, I, I changed her. But again, it's a perfect example. When you're on the stage, which a lot of people feel they always are, did I sing the right song? Did I hit the right notes? Um, it, it's sad versus just being up there and trying to help people. So that was something, you know, I've spent a lot of my life standing on a stage talking to people. And the issue wasn't, will they applaud? Will they be happy? It was, can I help them? Can I share with them what I'd like them to know? And, you know, then they can go home saying thank you for what I shared with them um, and not critical of me or what I said or how I said it. Um, it's about my experience and I always share my experience. So people can't say he's making up stories or lying or no, I'm telling you about people I took care of. They became my teachers. You see what transformed my life in a sense it was really fascinating. I went to a weekend workshop run by Dr. Carl Simonton who had written the book getting well again to help cancer patients with imagery and things like that. I was the only doctor out of 150 people in the room. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Here's a, a radiation oncologist talking about how to help cancer patients. And I am the only doctor in the state of Connecticut who came. That shows you how uh, poorly oriented medicine is. Well, Carl Jung said this, God knows, 100 years ago, the diagnosis helps the doctor, but it doesn't help the patient. For there, True. the key thing is the story. 
for it alone shows human background and human suffering. And only at that point can the doctor's therapy begin to operate. But doctors and the drug companies don't understand that. They don't answer my letter or change their ads. I always say, if my house burned down and my family died, and I go to the doctor saying, boy, am I depressed. What does the doctor say? Oh, here's a pill. Right. Don't you want yes. to talk to me, help me, know why I'm depressed? No. You know, and the drug companies well, won't put in a line that says, tell me what's happening. Because I've written to some, I've given up. But I said, you know, instead of saying I went to my doctor, he gave me an antidepressant, I feel better now. At least say we talked about my problems. He gave me an antidepressant. I feel better now. But they never change the ad. And most doctors, again, are not doctors because they care about people. See, I do a lot of work Well, let drawing. me ask you, Bernie, let, let me ask you a question about the doctors, about how telemedicine is working these days, where we're actually able to have a conversation with some yeah. doctors over the phone. And I think this has been a good move towards what you've been trying to achieve. What do you feel about it? Well, it depends what they're talking about. See, if, if it's still like an office visit where all you talk about is your disease and your medicine and that sort of thing, I don't think it's any different than going to the office. But if you're talking about how are things going at home, how are you dealing with isolation, how are this, how is that? Yeah, that would help a lot. And especially, it may help more because the doctors are in isolation too and living what their patients are living. They, because what I learned again was there's one, um, he wrote uh, Healing Lessons by Dr. Sidney Winnower from Sloan Kettering. He sent me a copy of his book. It's about his wife's experience with cancer. And as I'm reading it, I come across a sentence. I want to apologize to Dr. Bernie Siegel. <sighs> I don't even, I didn't even know him. What am I, what are you apologizing for? So I call him up. He said, I'm apologizing for what I thought of you. See, mm. now that my wife has cancer, you are a big help. Mm. We have your book in the living room. We have your meditation day. You know, we're listening, we're learning. Thank you. And you see, again, he isn't trained to take care of people. He was trained to treat disease. But when I came right. home from that workshop, let me just mention this. I came in on Monday, had gone there on Saturday and Sunday. And one of my partners, Dr. Richard Selzer, who's a very intuitive fellow, as I walked in the office, he said, you're gone. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're not the same person you were on Friday. And boy, I never forget him saying that. And why? Mm. Because all my patients were sitting around me. I wasn't at a desk. They weren't separated from me. Mm -hmm. And the sense that changed my life literally was, you're a nice guy. I feel better when I'm in the office with you, but I can't take you home with me. So I need to know how to live between office visits. And believe wow. me, when I got back to the office, I moved the furniture. Everything against the wall except the chairs. And people would come in and say, this doesn't feel like a doctor's office. That's right. We're sitting facing each other, nothing between us. And, mm. and they didn't, you know, they were uncomfortable at first, but then they felt good being with that, the person. And my hope is some of this modern communication, you know, may help create that too. You know, if you're face to face, like we are, we're Possibly. apart, but we're face to face. Yeah. Yes. Mm hmm. Possibly. So and I was asking you earlier about the situation that we're in in terms of a, a, a world pandemic and in a isolated way, we're trying to deal with the constant current, current nature of change that we're experiencing. So you taught us to connect our mind, our body, our spirit through a place of love. How can we apply that to what we're doing now to this to this experience of uncertainty and not knowing about the virus and the contagious yeah. nature how can that apply to now well i'd say one aspect is not just fighting death 
You know what I mean? Not just trying to keep people from dying. I mean, in the hospital, literally, you rarely hear the word death. People pass, fail, go to, you know, the special place. I even had a nurse tell me a patient braided. I said, what are you talking about? The morgue was in the Brady building. So that was her way of saying somebody died. I mean, we have to be willing to face death. I mean, there was even an article written by uh, several doctors on eight hour shifts in the intensive care unit. And it's called Not On My Shift. They were keeping a man from being dead. He's not alive, if you know what I mean. He's not experiencing life, enjoying the day. And one of them finally realized what they were doing to this man. You know, it was like torturing him. So he let him die on his shift and then wrote an article for a medical journal on it. And I think that's the part we have to understand. If we're helping people to live, even in the face of a pandemic, um, help people live. And you know what? The volunteers who are helping everybody live end up living longer than the people you know, who are angry at God, hiding, not touching anyone, uh, you know, isolating themselves, not thinking about anyone but themselves. Yeah, that changes their chemistry. The, just in a simple way of saying it, uh, I'm sort of a clown. I like to have fun when I go places, you know, into stores. I mean, I'm always doing this. So people know who I am. I mean, let me just say what I mean by that. If I call up a pizza restaurant and I order Chinese food over the phone, <laughs> they immediately say, is this Dr. Siegel? Yes. You see, <laughs> they know. I mean, yesterday yeah. I pulled up at the bank window and I said, is my order ready? My wife called and ordered a pizza, you know, and the bank. You, you know, just like to them, make people laugh. Yes. I said, <laughs> look, go talk to the old timers and say this man pulled up and asked for his pizza. Do you know who that is? And they'll tell you it's Dr. Siegel. <laughs> but they don't well, forget that you is, that. It's, so it's we a, a great people. medicine. Yes. Yeah. And this student at the uh, University of South Florida, he told his professor he wanted to show that your emotions affected stress hormone levels and immune system. And his professor really didn't believe him. But he said, all right, because the kid was persistent. So he got two actors, gave them a comedy script, and then a tragedy in which the man had murdered the woman's husband and they meet. And the student drew their blood while they were performing. And of course, he was right. Comedy, immune function goes up, stress hormone levels down. When it's in a tragedy, immune function goes down, stress hormone up. So, it, you know, I always say to people, act as if you're the person you want to be. And when cancer patients in one study in one of the Scandinavian countries, they were told, laugh for half an hour every three or four hours. No reason, wow. laugh. At the end of the study, they had a better survival rate than the people who were in the control group and, you know, were just told if something funny happens, fine, but don't laugh for no reason. And some of the psychiatrists who thought I was nuts decades ago, one said, well, I'm going to start a support group to show it's meaningless. You know, all the things Siegel saying, you help people to live and they live longer and blah, blah. So he started a support group to prove I was wrong. And at the end of a year, of course, it showed I was right because the people in his support group had a better survival than his control group. And he was honest enough to not throw it out and let it change him, see? No. And the problem is this too, that we're trained to separate people into mind and body and spirit too, but that doctors don't pay attention to at all. So when you go to a doctor, what are they treating? I wrote articles, sent them to medical journals. They came back saying, interesting, but inappropriate for our journal. It was about patients' oh. dreams, drawings, emotions, all these mm. things. So I sent it to a psychiatry journal. It was sent back again, but this is the new comment. Yes, it's appropriate, but it isn't interesting. We know all this. See, that's the tragedy. 
I have paintings literally right over my head here entitled The Doctor and the Consultation. Mm. The doctor is mm. painted by the artist Sir Luke Fildes. His little child died. And mm. it's a room with parents, the child, and the doctor. What's the mm. doctor doing? Thinking. And the child is lying limp with his arm hanging down off these the chairs that he's on. And the parents are, you know, grieving in the background. Why didn't the doctor say to the parents, pick up your child and hold him? Give him some right. love. You know, yes. the truth yes. is, and we've seen this, when you give them the love, because this has happened a lot of times in newborn special care units. They're all sure this kid's not going to survive. So there's no point in isolating him from his parents. So they And then he does. The yes. And yes. Yeah. Mama takes the kid, puts it against her bare breast. He starts suckling and comes back to life. They, yes. It's so, amazing. Yeah. So we learn let me just ask from, you, Bernie. Yeah. I'm sorry, let me just ask you. So is this is a, a medicine that we should be having now? Is is laughter is a, a lot more to balance out our immune systems, to end yeah. a little bit of stress, is to bring in this way of of maybe humor, maybe it's compassion and it's a lot more love. Right. Do you think that'll to balance find the some immune system? In all of this. You know, whether it's talking to your children about what they can learn from this. Um, but, you know, to not see it as a curse. Uh, look what's happening. This is awful. What a terrible life. Um, survival behavior is something put into children by their parents. You know, I mean, I grew up with what I call mottos to live by. I didn't appreciate them when I was a kid. What do I mean by that? Ma, I had a terrible day. God is redirecting you. Something good will come of this. Well, I have to make a choice. You know, do I want to be a plumber or do I want to be a doctor? Do what makes you happy. And I won the lottery. Oh, now let's make life easier for other people with the money. And I can tell you when you're a kid having a horrible day and your mother says God is redirecting you, you don't really feel very happy about what your mother just told you when you're looking for help. Um, and so I spent more time talking to God than my mother, perhaps. But <laughs> I realized later in life that they were giving me mottos to live by. For instance, mm. I, I just spoke to someone, I was just shopping, and uh, I, again, it's me getting to know everybody. Where do you go to school? What do you start? Oh, I'm going to be a nurse. I said, okay, I have a question for you. You're asked by a friend or family member to do something that you do not want to do. You know, it could be, I can, I have no time. What do you tell the person? And she said, what 95% of nurses said, oh, I, I would do it, I would do it. I said, think about that. You're saying no to yourself all the time. What's that gonna do for your help? They, and that's characteristic of nurses. At a nursing convention, when you ask that question, raise your hand if you would do something you don't want to do for your family or friends. And all the hands go up. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. not help. See, when psychiatrists study survivors, one of the questions was, if you're asked to do a favor for a neighbor, friend, family that you don't want to do, what do you tell them? The right answer is no. That's an immune competent personality answer, see? Uh. So it, it's, again, having meaning in your life. I mean, they're all simple questions, but the psychiatrist came up with it um, during the AIDS epidemic. You see, because he realized he's helping them deal with something they have no treatment for and threatening their lives. But he noticed there are some people who are doing well and getting better, even becoming HIV negative with no therapy. And so Amazing. he put together immune competent personality as wow. something for people to learn. Yeah. See, and Monday morning, we have you... more heart attacks. Let me just say, Monday morning, we have more heart attacks, strokes, suicides, and illnesses. And the first question in his list is, do you have a sense of meaning in your daily work and activities? Now, if your daily work and activities are pain in the ass and I don't want to go, I hate my job, and boss is a... What is it doing to you? Yeah. But as you said, I'm going today. 
it's not work. It's what I, you know, want to do. It's my way of helping people. So it doesn't matter, you know, whether, as I say, you're a plumber, a surgeon, a police officer, and so forth. Your personality will reveal how you feel about what you're doing and how you treat people. Yeah. I so that's that. definitely something that we can work on right now is that we can work on having this type of attitude you're talking about where it's helpful to other people, where we're in a place of intermittent joy. Yeah. It's it's okay. What you should I know do, that it's tough. Because mm. I, I donate to a charity that helps kids around the world. And every now and then you get a letter from, or, or I got a drawing today from this child. She drew a house, no chimney on it, two trees next to it, no earth. You know, it's a house like floating in the middle of the page with two trees, probably her parents. But I wrote a note and sent it back saying, you need a chimney on your house to let the hot air out. Mm. And you need support under your feet to hold the house up. And I hope they mail it back to her. I forgot what country she's from. But um, oh. Oh, I use drawings with patients. You know, draw yourself at work. As a matter of fact, medical students, when I said to them, <clears throat> draw yourself working as a doctor, I almost fell over when they handed me like 100 drawings. Only one drawing had the student touching a patient. He was oh, kneeling next to the lady in the wheelchair, giving mm. her a tissue. See, that's a real doctor. Mm. One, there is, had no there's... human being in it at all. And all of the rest, they're sitting at a desk with a diploma on the wall behind them. Not a single mm. patient in Well, <laughs> in I must those say... Doors. This is, I mean, we really, we only have a minute left in the show, but I want to continue on to another interview with you because you have such great stories and I really haven't gotten to ask you the questions that I wanted to ask about uh, how do we uh, deal with so these unprecedented times. But I do All agree right. with you that our medical system is healing and it is, and we are definitely getting there because our nurses and doctors have put through, they've been put through so much in these last few months and they are really coming through. So let's continue our interview with you again right. and another day. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernie Siegel. Until next time, well, well, I invite you to you. Thank you. And until next time, I invite you to stay aware.